places in the world, like glaciers in Alaska and canyons in Colorado with rivers flowing through them. I thought it would take me to volcanoes in Hawaii and then to waterfalls. I've been to all these places, but these pictures were taken on vacation. <laughs> Instead, my life as a geologist took me to waste sites because I decided to become an environmental geologist. I wanted to find out why waste leaked and where it would go and how it would get into the water cycle. I also find myself on top of roofs downloading data while I overlook the city of Philadelphia or putting wells underneath parking lots or sometimes digging around literally in damaged streams. These are the places where geology and humans interact. And I get a chance to see how science affects society. I find out a little bit about what some of the roadblocks are in terms of questions we don't know the answers to, but also in terms of how people perceive science and some of the roadblocks that that creates. And I'm going to be talking to you today about several interesting problems involving radioactive waste and flooding and road salt. And I'm also going to talk about some of the limitations that we have in terms of getting people interested in looking at these problems. So the focus of my studies is the water cycle. And I like this picture of the water cycle because my daughter painted it. And she painted it on the bathroom wall of a park nearby. They, she called it the natural water cycle because she and her friends also painted the road map of where the pipes go through the streets of our city. And every urinal needs a waterfall for inspiration. She gets her sense of humor from her father. <laughs> so back to the water cycle. We teach the water cycle in middle school, so right, we understand it. There's actually a lot of questions that we don't know about this water cycle. Um, take rainfall. We know it falls, but we actually don't know how it's distributed. It falls differently in different places, and we don't have a good understanding of that yet. Once the rain falls, it gets underground, or sometimes it divides off and goes over the land, and we don't know what that subdivision is. And that's very important if we're going to understand flooding and not get surprised by it. Once the rain is underground, it flows through rock, but it can also flow through waste that we put underground and sometimes move it into the water cycle, which we don't want to have happen because we're trying to drink the water, right? Eventually, that water discharges to surface water, lakes, and streams, and we don't actually know where it's discharging because the surface water kind of blocks our view of what's happening underneath. Then eventually, the water evaporates and it starts the water cycle over again. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of problems related to the water cycle. And I'm going to start with this subdivision between which water penetrates underground and which water is running off over land. We know that when we put buildings up and houses and streets and even lawns, we keep water from infiltrating. Even lawns don't do a very good job of infiltrating. We think green, oh, that's good, but not lawns. And when the water can't infiltrate, it rushes to the stream too fast and it creates flooding. And this is a problem not only for the humans, but it's a problem for the things that are living in the stream. Their habitat is getting disrupted. Um, for us, it, when it overflows the bank, it's disrupted. For those things that are living right in the stream bed, every violent storm is an upheaval of where they live. They may get buried by sediment or the storm may just move where they're living. So th this is a very damaged environment. There's a couple things that we can do to try to create infiltration and prevent that kind of a flooding. One of the things is we dig trenches and then we fill the trenches with coarse material to try to store water and then infiltrate it more slowly. What I did in this experiment here is I had three separate trenches and I filled it with different material to try to figure out maybe which kind of things might work better. Um, so. Remember how I said we don't always get rain to fall where we want to? When I was doing this experiment, that's what happened, and I just took a garden hose and I made it rain on my trenches with the garden hose. Another thing that we sometimes do to increase infiltration is build wetlands. And um, this particular land area was very choked with weeds, and that was preventing infiltration. 
So we dug down to where the water table was, and then eventually we planted plants and a wetland developed. And this can be a place where we can store water before it rushes off to the nearby stream. Unfortunately, the stream nearby is still severely damaged. Some of the things that happen in streams are we get really steep banks with a lot of erosion. And that erosion is like a landslide for the critters that are living in the stream happening every day. When I stand at that particular stream bank, I can actually hear the sediment falling into the water, plop, plop, plop. It's eroding that fast. Um, and I measured the erosion rates before and after we put these infiltration devices in that watershed, and they were about the same before and after. It was still very fast. Another problem that happens in streams is that tree roots get exposed to the air, and that's not, the tree roots don't grow in the air. They've been eroded away. And the beauty of this stream is kind of disturbed by the feeling that that sycamore is going to fall over any time. So what happened here is that we had a very big watershed that was urbanizing. We were building roads and, and houses and lawns and things like that. And the infiltration devices that we put in had a very small capture area. It was just too small to make a really big difference in the stream. One of the things that happens is I think that the general public and urban planners think we can engineer our way out of everything. But if we don't understand the water cycle, we're not going to design the right things to try to protect our environment. So this is a challenge for us. Let's look at another arrow on the water cycle, which is the groundwater flow. So um, I mentioned before that when groundwater is flowing under in the, the subsurface, it can also flow through waste areas. And that could be a problem because then the waste could leak and sometimes get into our water supply. I've worked on a lot of different waste areas in my career, and um, this is probably the strangest one that I worked at. It's a place where they dispose of radioactive uranium. And I know what you're probably thinking is, I don't want to go anywhere near there. But we produce this waste. We produce this waste, and somebody has to figure out where to get rid of it, and somebody has to study where the, whether that's working okay. So if we as a society are going to produce this, we're going to have to go to sites like these. So um, we know that waste sometimes leaks. And somebody asked the question, if this waste leaks, if this uranium leaks, could it go into a configuration that would go critical? A criticality event is what happens when a nuclear bomb goes off. It doesn't always have to be explosive, and I think what they were worried about at this site is it might get into a configura configuration where it get really hot and generate a lot of heat and radioactivity, and that's not, that wouldn't be a good thing either. So somebody asked the question, and we set out to answer it. When you're trying to answer a question like this, one of the first things that you have to understand is how the water is flowing through rock, because it's flowing through both the rock and the waste, and when it's doing that, the chemicals that are released are mixing together. So we need to understand how water flows through rock. And I'm going to talk about that here. Um, some of this you probably already know without realizing it. There's some things about how water flows through rock. So I'm going to get my water out here. So pretend this is groundwater. I put it in a beaker so you can actually see it. Underground, we don't get to see it. So if I pour salt in here, I think you can anticipate what's going to happen. It's going to dissolve. You know that from cooking when we salt our food and the, and the salt dissolves. Um, you know that seawater is salty because it can dissolve a lot of salt. I can pour quite a bit of salt in there and it's going to dissolve away. Now on the other hand, if I decide to pour some sand in my beaker, do you expect that to dissolve very readily? No, I mean, that's why beaches are there. They get hit by the waves constantly, and they're not dissolving. So there's a lot of stuff that you kind of intuitively know. Some of the things are a bit in between. So if you take a limestone, is it going to dissolve? Hmm, so if you've ever been in a cave, you know that some of the cave is dissolved away. That's why you're standing in that open space. The walls are typically limestone. 
So s it, it depends with something like limestone. It depends on the particular environment, and it, it depends on how much time you have. So this is kind of something that's in between. What's interesting about the, um, what happens when limestone dissolves is that the chemicals that get released actually make uranium more mobile. So this is why we have to understand how the water is flowing through the rocks in this mixture of different chemicals that we can have. So we've got to understand whether something like that is dissolving or not, what particular environment. So we set up a problem to try to answer this question of um, whether the uranium could go critical in a waste site. And what we did is we assumed that the uranium was leaking. We started with that. And what we wanted to know is what happened when it stopped. So it's like playing musical chairs. You want to see who's got a seat. What does it look like when we're done? And we took a lot of different um, uh, both chemical reactions and equations describing groundwater flow and groundwater transport. And we programmed that in the criticality equations. We programmed that into a supercomputer and did a very large number of runs. And what we found out is that it's okay to visit this waste site without explosion-proof suits. So with the right team of people and the right tools, we were able to answer a pretty tricky question. But there's still many other waste sites out there and a lot of really challenging questions that we need to address. So let's look at one more place on the water cycle. And this is where water is discharging, just, um, surface water. And what I want you to picture is Mirror Lake in New Hampshire. We know the water's discharging, that's why it's got a lake there. But the places that it's discharging are underwater, and so we don't know where they are. It's hard to measure things underwater. What we typically do when we're trying to measure discharge is we put in seepage meters. And these are 55-gallon drums. We saw them in half, and we shove them into the sediment. We attach a bag to them and see how much water is going in or out of that bag. And no matter how many times I tell my students not to take a picture of my rear end, if you're doing seepage meter work, this is what you're doing. You're bending over and squishing it into the sediments. But sometimes, like at Mirror Lake, we want to find out what's going on in some of the deeper waters. And then you need to don some scuba diving equipment and get a seepage meter down in deeper in the lake. So that's what we did at Mirror Lake. In addition, we use some geophysical tools to also image the subsurface. So we have a geophysical cable running across the lake where our seepage meter is. This is a cross section of the image that we got from the geophysical um, cable. And what you see here is the lake is shown in green and our cable is laying on the lake bottom in this case. And then we've got our seepage meter here. What the geophysics showed us is where the bedrock was and where sediments were lying over the lake. So this is kind of neat. We're seeing beneath the water. But it also showed a very conductive area. And from the water that came out this seepage meter, we found it was salty. So there was salt discharging to this lake, and all by putting these different tools together. And we know where the salt is coming from, even. One of the busiest highways in New Hampshire is running right next to that lake. And when you want to drive in the winter, you've got to put salt on the roads, right? So they, the highway department was concerned because they started noticing some, um, the people who work at Mirror Lake started noticing the uh, salt concentration going up. So they put a big berm in next to the highway to try to keep the salt from getting into the stream and then into the lake. But what our study showed is that they hadn't cut off the groundwater pathway. So because we didn't understand the water cycle, we came up with a solution that really didn't solve the problem. So salt water is still seeping into Mirror Lake, but it's happening underneath where the discharge occurs that we can't see. So we've talked about a number of different parts of the water cycle. Um, we've talked about where the water's going in, we've talked an example where it's moving along underground and then where it's discharging. And one of the points that I want to make is that there's a lot of interesting questions here and that if we can really do a, um, keep challenging ourselves to answer these questions, then we can help solve environmental problems and do a better job. But um, it can be really hard to get people to recognize that there's still questions out there and 
um, sometimes I feel like there's just not enough people interested, and this really worries me. Um, I think that the thing that keeps me awake at night more is that salt water rather than uranium. People have an eye on that uranium. We know that it's unsafe to be around uranium, but I don't think we're really recognizing that when we pour water, when we pour salt into our surface water, and then we count on that surface water for our drinking water, that we're having a pretty big effect on our environment. So I'm kind of worried about the things that um, are unseen. And I feel like we have a people problem. Um, if you look around the world at how we go about educating students in, in terms of math and science, um, the U.S. isn't doing that well. Anybody know how we rank in terms of math education in the world? Are we in the top 10? No. How about the top 20? Most people think we actually are in the top 20. If you survey people, they say we're about 17. How about top 30? Not quite. We're, we're ranked 32 in the world. We're a country that is rich in terms of resources, in terms of wealth, in terms of people, and we're ranked 32 in the world. There are developing countries that rank higher than us, countries with dictatorships that rank higher than us, little teeny tiny countries that rank higher than us, 32 in the world. How are we doing on reading? We rank 14 in the world on reading. This is the same set of minds. It's the same set of people. So we take kids that are curious and kind of born scientists, and we teach them reading, and we teach them to hate math. There's something a little bit wrong with that, right? We're developing a country of math phobes. Um, Sion Bylock said in her, in her book, Choke, she said, nobody boasts that they cannot read. If you're illiterate, you hide it, and maybe you try to find some program that will teach you to read. But I don't know how many times I've heard someone say, oh, I just don't do math. We can't afford to do that in this country. We've got to get people excited about solving these problems and, it, and wanting to do a good job in math and not afraid to learn math. We've got to get away from this math phobe. So I'm here to encourage you to embrace your inner scientist. What do I mean by that? If you're a scientist, you should talk about what you do and how much fun it is. You should tell people what the interesting questions are and try to explain the answers in a way that they can understand. If you're not a scientist, you should ask questions. You should listen to the answers. You should not be afraid to hear or ask more questions. You should encourage your children and your grandchildren and your fellow students to become scientists. And then maybe they can have an office like I do in the middle of a lake. <laughs>